Welcome to the Legislative Council meeting of June 21st. I think um, the first thing I'll be looking for is an adoption of the agenda. Councillor Lemko, is there any additions or deletions to that agenda? Not seeing any, I'll ask for a vote. Carried. An adoption of the minutes. Councillor Bullock, are there any errors or omissions? Seeing none, I'll call for the vote. Carried. There are no delegations today, so I guess we'll be moving uh, to our director role, community services. Uh, thank you, Council. Uh, first item is a memorandum to Council uh, uh, dated uh, June 7th. Uh, the topic is temporary road closures for Vegreville summer block parties. This is proposed uh, by Julie Gottslig, manager of FCSS and uh, Vegreville and District Family Community Support Services. Uh, background, the Vegreville Cares Coalition has put together a block party initiative to increase community connection, strengthen community action and create supportive environments. Block parties will be planned and hosted by local residents after submitting a registration form and the required permit requests. Residential roads, cul-de-sacs and alleyways may be blocked off to facilitate, facilitate the hosting of these events. Due to the limited number of council meetings during the summer months, allowing the CAO permission to approve or deny entry permits requests will expedite the potential time constraint to approve each temporary road closure. The CAO's temporary authority will only be active during the summer months of June, July, and August of 2022. The communication strategy on behalf of Vegreville Co-Cares Coalition, FCSS will be responsible for contacting Public Works, RCMP, and Fire Department to notify them of the temporary road closure and determine management of the temporary street closure. Times and dates of approved temporary road closures will be communicated as a news item on the Town of Vegreville website and through social media channels with a map indicating the road closure location. At the end of the summer, FCSS will present a block party report to Council regarding the number of parties requested, hosted, number of road closures approved or denied, and any additional survey feedback. Uh, Council's options may, uh, option one, Council may grant temporary authority to the CAO to approve or deny temporary road closures for, for specific purpose of hosting a variable block party. Option two, council may choose to review each permit individually at regular scheduled council meetings. Is there any discussions? This would be brought forward, I imagine, to our regular council? Yes, this will be brought forward as an RCD uh, based on the direction from council today. Councilor Bullock. Uh, Director Rowe, I'm just curious, in the block party when they decide to have one or gets approved and stuff, so that whole block would that be blocked off all the residents, would they be contacted? So the the process is right now, uh, when an application is submitted, uh, they're given uh, f brochures or flyers that they're to go to all the neighborhood, invite them to the block party, let them know when, when it will be the times and the <coughs> when the road may be closed. It may be a small, small portion of a road, it may be an entire road, but it'll be the decision of the, the, part, the person filling out the request and in discussion with the, uh, with the local community. And then those those requests will come. And the reason this is here is simply because uh, I think we're at 26. Is that what, 20 more? So more than 26 already. So uh, by by authorizing the CAO, uh, him and myself can uh, look at the request and and do this uh, deny or approve the the closure rather than each one coming to town council. And in the event that there's a two a two week span between regular council meetings, because that's the only time you can approve a road closure is at a regular council meeting. So that's why it's here today. So, but all the part all the block parties are in consultation with the with the whole neighborhood. Councilor Lemko. Yes. Uh, the uh, this is part three of uh, a Cal's grant. 
I believe the grant was for $5,000, uh, if I remember correctly. Uh, and part one and part two have been completed. Part two was the uh, uh, champions for, um, for block parties, getting uh, people identified. Uh, and part three, to close out the, uh, the grant, is to have the block parties. So I, I fully think this is a, a better way to go than to uh, have council uh, <coughs> having to approve 29 or 35. We'd probably never get through it in time because uh, our summers are off uh, uh, some days. So to approve a block, uh, a road closure would be, I think this is the, the right idea, right way to go. Okay. So for clarity, we're not actually being asked to approve block parties. We're simply being requested to give the temporary authority to the CAO uh, to approve the block parties that are being requested, such that they don't have to come to council uh, during, especially during a time period when council may not be meeting. So this would come down then to our regular council meeting for a where we would be able to actually vote on that and see it through. Thank you. Uh, do we have another one? <coughs> Two of four. Uh, so this is a BMX uh, bike track proposal uh, that is attached on your agendas. Uh, this is dated June 14, 2022 from B&W Asphalt and Colville Construction Limited to uh, uh, contractors in the town of Eggerville. Uh, BMX track proposal. This will be a joint uh, project. Uh, so for clarification, this is uh, the uh, expansion of the BMX track at Foxview Park that was uh, presented uh, last year in the parks plan. Uh, there is a small BMX uh, park that was done many years ago by the parks department and public works. And this is basically to uh, take that and enhance it. So this will be a joint project with the Town of Eggerville, Coville Construction and B&W Asphalt. Uh, project parameters reshape the existing track using materials that are on site or supplied by the town. Construct a new track on the north side of the original track using materials <coughs> on site or supplied by the town. Layout of new track will be discussed and agreed upon by all parties involved. Grade the south side of the lot for parking area and place gravel supplied by the town. Existing material on site is black soil, which is not ideal for minimizing maintenance, is recommended to use imported clay wherever possible to prevent track deterioration in wet conditions, clay to be supplied and delivered by the Town of Eggerville. Grass seeding and all the track maintenance is the responsibility of the Town of Eggerville. Exporting and disposal of excess black dirt upon project completion is the responsibility of the Town of Eggerville. The estimated price for the project is approximately 21000 to 24000 Colville Construction and B&W Asphalt will be invoicing 10000 and the remainder of the cost will be donated by these companies. And there would be a, uh, a naming, uh, naming rights to these companies uh, uh, for, the, for the track. Any questions? Councillor Bullock? The uh, big pile of dirt that's there anyways would have to be moved anyways, correct? And that's that's a large p uh, part of this cost is uh, the town simply does not have the available equipment. We need a track hole that can take that. That pile has been there since I was, a well, you and I were little kids. And so uh, basically it is to remove that pile, which is actually sitting on uh, designated municipal lots. So we'd be moving that, using some of that material to reshape uh, the uh, the new BMX track. Any others? Councillor Lemko? Yeah, I think when you have a, a track like that, it's part of the, the parks plan, but more importantly, I believe a majority of that uh, hill right now is sitting on residential property in the Fox U.S. state, so it'll have to be moved eventually regardless. And we have uh, a couple of local businesses who are willing to, uh, to assist in that project, and I think it's uh, noble on their part, and uh, I, I think it's a good idea. Okay, so this again would be coming down for uh, council approval. I do have one question, and that's the invoicing of 10,000. Do we have that covered as a budget item at the moment, or is that a, 
No, we, it item. was not a budgeted item this year, uh, but uh, uh, for this, uh, we do have a hundred and fifty or hundred and forty-seven thousand dollars in a parks reserve that this money could be uh, brought out of that reserve. Okay. So is um, that council's direction then in the RCD would be to uh, have the balance of the funds taken from the parks reserve? So that'll come to us on our regular council money. Yeah. And your next one, please. Uh, this is a memorandum to council. Uh, the uh, topic is Paint the Town Mural 2022 Initiative. This is proposed by the uh, Vergerville Tourism Advisory Board. Uh, the background of the Town of Vergerville Tourism Advisory Board. Paint the Town Mural Initiative commenced in 2019 and has been dedicated to revitalizing the downtown core activating public spaces with public art and fostering community spirit while paying homage to our heritage and Vegreville's world-famous Pasenka. The VTAB approved 2020 mural is a constitution of a series of public art installations focused on creating a visual story of the, our community and its history. Artist Joss Harnick's submission from the 2021 Call for Artist is the VTAB endorsed mural for 2022, noting its design is of significant timely re re relevance after reviewing potential location, uh, VTAB's recommended uh, front facade of ceramic cottage and framed custom framing has been approved by the building owners, Greg and Chris Kerlick. The mural will be painted on panels off site and brought in for installation later this summer. The prime downtown location is a continuation of the initiative's goal of adding value to the cultural, aesthetic, and economic vi vitality of our community. And the uh, the rendition of it uh, is on the back page for you uh, to see. Uh, the financial implications are $6,500, and this is a budgeted item through the tourism and culture budget. Communication strategy, once the mural is complete and mounted in place, a press release will be issued on behalf of the town and posted on our tent website and social media. Uh, council's option or approve the recommendation by the VTAB for the 2022 paint the town mural or decline and send back to VTAB for ultimate recommend recommendations any questions comments go ahead councillor Bellick. yeah i reviewed it here and i think it the the mural uh, plan looks really good and you know, it couldn't uh, be going on a more fitting building at this time of in light of the situation in ukraine right now so that's all i have to say i'll echo that in fact that i think that uh the more that we can beautify that street down there, the better it'll be. So I think that is a nice looking mural. So that'll come to us once again on regular council for final approval. Okay, thank you. And one more time. Actually, two more, four or five. Two more, right, sorry. <laughs> uh, this is a letter from the Vegreville Vipers, uh, the junior hockey team. Uh, further to our presentation to town council requesting an expansion of the existing dressing room or in the alternative an expansion to include a dressing for the vipers uh, they met with myself uh, on june 10th at the wally fadoon arena uh, during our meeting with uh, with phil options were discussed including the previous uh, suggestions of an expansion to the arena the previous suggestion to the town included drawings provided by vantage builders to either the town or myself we believe that Phil was going to contact Vantage to determine whether the previous drawings could be located. In any event, during the meeting, options were discussed regarding, one, adding onto the existing dressing room, two, proceeding with large expansion out of the south side of the arena, which was to include the addition of several dressing rooms, perhaps a referee room and offices, and three, proceeding with a similar expansion to the east side of the arena, which would house just the expansion for the junior team. It was concluded that this option was the best option. At the end of our meeting, I requested that uh, the Vipers provide uh, the town uh, and council with uh, a letter in hopes uh, for the new expansion and what the expansion would look like and what would be included in that expansion. Uh, they have enclosed a sketch uh, for their expansion. Uh, and then basically it was to uh, send this letter to council we believe the best use of the junior expansion needs to include space for merchandise storage offices for the coach general manager 
uh, storage space for the team's necessities, sticks, pucks, jerseys, uh, washrooms for the players, including showers, laundry room space, uh, separate entry for the players, coaches, and staff, self-enclosed workout room with machines provided by the organization, not the town, players' lounge, video review room uh, would need uh, fiber optic, internet access, industrial fil air filtration system, uh, will be required, most importantly, a larger enhanced dressing room to accommodate the full roster of 27 plus three goalies, coaches, and additional players. We are confident that if this expansion is approved, it will attract top players. This option for the expansion would involve the entry into the rink on the south side of the wall. Uh, it was advised that this area does not have to have asbestos in the walls, and therefore this option would be the least expensive to undertake. Should the town approve the junior expansion, we would propose a rental agreement for at least a three-year term, whereby the Vipers would pay rent for this space. Rent would be payable on a yearly basis and not just during the hockey season. Until the town advises the ultimate decision regarding the dressing room expansion, uh, they're not able to advise on the amount of rent the Vipers would be willing to pay. Once the cost becomes known, we'd be pleased to enter into discussions regarding the rent. Kindly advise whether or not you require anything further from us in order to have Town Council review our request. Thank you for your assistance in this matter. Yours truly, Lorianne Coho, President and Owner of the Vergaville Vipers. So, uh, after uh, the Vipers presentation, uh, I had in, uh, informed Council that I was meeting with uh, all of the uh, arena users. Uh, including the the new uh, or the resurrected Junior B Rangers team, <laughs> the Vipers' request was specifically for uh, uh, additional dressing rooms. So I met with them. Uh, there was uh, plans in the past that uh, I don't believe they they ever made it to council back. Uh, I'm thinking somewhere in the, the range of like 2008, 2009, uh, but that was considered. Uh, that area to the east, it's a grassed area, a triangle area uh, south of the social center, east of the of the arena. That is a non-asbestos wall. Uh, the, all the brick walls uh, on the north and south are, are do have asbestos. So any any remediation that or any expansion on either of those sides would 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 result in um, in doing asbestos remediation. So. That area between myself and uh, the facilities department and the Vipers, we feel that is probably the best location if we're going to uh, look at something, uh, utilities, uh, especially uh, the uh, uh, sanitary sewer is uh, will be a challenge, but uh, basically looking for council's direction on what uh, which direction you want me to, to go in. Uh, what I could do is I uh, Vantage is looking because there was a drawing, but it was it was not a fully engineered drawing, but it was a uh, a proposal uh, back in the day. So we're we're trying to locate that. Uh, that might give us a you know a helping hand as to uh, what the projected costs you know were back at that time, and we can work from that. But is this council's direction to? Uh, have me continue further with Vantage and look at uh, having something, what, what the costs are even to design it, because it wouldn't be a free design. But then from there, the financial aspect of it, uh, you know, there's, I mean, there's different ways. Uh, ultimately, the town would probably be the one to, to make the original payment on this and then use, uh, pay, off, pay off that debt with uh, a rental, because we, I don't think it's in the best. It's not in our best interest to have a, a private person uh, pay to expand on a public building. So, by us paying for it and then having it paid off through uh, through a rental agreement is the best uh, the best way forward. Any questions, Councillor Warba? So. I don't want to see us have to put a bunch of you know money at this point into something, but if you could try to find as much information as you can, because the part that I'm struggling with here is even where that first step for an approval goes, because of the fact that we have to have some ballpark of what we're talking about. Um, in fairness to another team that's looking to come back in, we I know we said when we walked around 
uh, that day that we would want to look at a number of factors. I believe what we said was um, benefits to not just one group, but what would benefit the majority of groups, what could bring in um, people to best way, and what was not, what would be uh, overall for the community versus helping an individual group. Um, so I think at the time we had mentioned that we would also potentially reach out to the junior Bs, ask them if they would have interest in expansion, and if so, if they were willing to have a financial contribution. So. For me, I just need a little bit more information before I can decide to go ahead. And I can appreciate um, what you're mentioning as far as, yeah, certainly uh, rental is the way to pay off something that's a town uh, asset. And I understand where be due to the asbestos, but right now the hard part is without knowing um, how big of an expansion or what we're looking at or for how many groups. It's a little bit hard uh, to know whether, you know, they're kind of, we're kind of saying here that this is the best option, but it may be that something as simple as just an expansion of an existing room might be the option that's looked at if there's no interest. So uh, I guess for me, I would hope if you could see what you could find from Vantage. And then the other thing is, um, I know it's early in the time for them and they're looking at um, still getting things going, but has there been any opportunity to speak with the junior Bs about whether they have interest or their thoughts on needing additional space? So yeah, I've, uh, I've met with every group except for the Vegreville Skating Club, and that is tomorrow. Uh, and I've identified all the needs and I'll be uh, presenting a report to, to council on what all of the, uh, what all the groups are, are looking for. Uh, I've had great conversations with, with all of the teams and I think what everybody just wants is some open lines of communication. Ice time, I think we've got that uh, figured out that we can, I think with some minor adjustments, we can effectively use all the ice. Again, the town is in the business of, of renting ice. We're not, uh, we're, we're not involved in anything else. We, we rent our building. It is that, That's our role here. So I have been working and to, to mediate between all the users and uh, my goal is uh, after meeting with the skating club and compiling all the information, we're going to have all the groups together meet collaboratively and make sure that uh, as the town of Agraville, we're we're working to ensure that all our group's uh, needs are, are met and for basically using everything the most effectively that we can. Yeah, that would help if you had Any other comments? Councilor Lemko. Yeah, uh, Director Rowe, it's uh, uh, a good idea that you met with all the user groups of our facility just to get a consensus of uh, their concerns or their wishes and, and that, well, that, which is great. I believe uh, when we look at uh, the expansion of that area, we look at future, if we're doing it once, uh, we should look at what that means down the road and what the costs are for that. I mean, we talk about our strategic goal and uh, one of our goals is quality of life and that's to, rather than building new facilities, new structures to uh, meet the needs of the people that are coming to our community and the ones that are already here, uh, we would, uh, expansion is probably the, the better way to go. So uh, I'd like to see some numbers because obviously without numbers we can't make any <coughs> Go ahead and uh, see if you can hurry up some dollars. Councillor Bullock. I agree with uh, Councillor Warwa on Lemco. Just a little more investigation. Okay. Not, that'd be great. Thanks. Okay, so what I see here is, is it is difficult for us to try and move forward on without realizing the overall implications. Likely the option that you're giving of expansion to the east is going to be the the best all we could do at any given point in time right now is a conditional support but what we would need to know is a bit of a, a cost and how it would be budgeted <clears throat> perhaps if we could get vantage to give us a rough ballpark of what kind of budgets we might be looking at and um, maybe we could move forward with a design and build where the company actually designs it and builds it uh, much like we did with the dressing rooms at the front. Um, also get some of the pros and cons. I'm assuming that if this space here was available for the Vipers that they would no longer require one of the dressing rooms that they're in. Uh, 
<clears throat> so that becomes Available. a plus for other te sports teams and events. So if we could have some of that information brought back to us, I don't think that we're really at a stage where we could take this to a regular council meeting. No, and uh, We'd have ultimately to, what I'm looking to try for is for council to give me the direction to. Yeah, that's what I think that we're this. doing is is we could see ourselves giving sort of a conditional support uh, if we can get more information that'll give us direction as to what we would be trying to support. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think what I was trying to not sure how to speak. Yeah. Okay. So we've got that. <clears throat> and your next one. Five of five. Five uh, of five. This is a uh, memorandum to council. <clears throat> the topic is the Parks and Open Spaces Bylaw XX-2022, proposed by myself. Uh, background, the Parks and Open Spaces Draft Bylaw was presented to council at the legislative meeting on May 4th, 2022. This draft bylaw was reviewed and commented on by administration, parks, tourism, and culture, and municipal enforcement departments prior to submission to town council. After the initial presentation of the draft bylaw, a workshop was scheduled for bylaw discussions. On May 31st and June 8th, town council met with administration to review the draft bylaw line by line for comments and feedback. All feedback and suggestions have been reviewed and applied to the most recent draft attached. This bylaw would brought forth to, re to the regular council meeting on June 27, 22. The Parks and Open Spaces bylaw will repeal four bylaws, 0693 Parks Bylaw, 0793 Amending Parks Bylaw, 082013 Campground Bylaw, and 062016 Amending Campground Bylaw. There's no financial applications to this. Uh, the communication strategy new bylaw will be placed on the town's website for public viewing. Uh, council's uh, options for uh, Monday uh, that can be sent to council can send the draft bylaw to the next council meeting on June 27th or they can refer back to administration for review and revisions. Okay, do we have any questions or comments? I will bring up one item. Um, in reviewing it a little closer and, and taking the background, I realized that council in our last workshop meeting may have brushed over one area a little too quickly without looking at it in more detail, and that's the consumption of liquor within the park. And so therefore, I think it's 9.3 on the bylaw. I think the wording there needs to be massaged in order to be more representative of what the um, Gaming Liquor and Cannabis Act actually allows. We were leaving it as a fairly open, and the Act actually says that it has to be in a designated picnic area, and that we have to designate that area, we have to sign that area, and we have to sp specify the times and hours. So I think that what we need to do is I think that this could probably still <clears throat> be massaged in that one area and brought down to us uh, on June 27th, because I think it's a, a minor wording change just to reflect the act. So we, at this point, uh, my recommendation is that we would ask administration to review that. The 9.3, primarily as it is written, could stand where we're saying that the consumption of alcohol and cannabis or liquor and cannabis, depending on the definition we want to use, um, is only permitted in a campsite by somebody who is camping, by somebody who is over 18, and then throw in the wording, uh, despite that section, an adult may consume liquor at a designated picnic area within the Elks Kingsman Park. And I think that something of that nature would then put us in compliance with the act and uh, administration would then be able to designate that site, put the signs the way it's supposed to be and, and specify the time. And I noted where we had sort of thrown out the idea of 11 a.m. to 11 p.m. Most of the communities like Edmonton, Calgary, Vancouver and others 
are actually say until 9 p.m. And that I could make that recommendation. When you do think of the time period that you're going to put on your site, because that'll be administrative, that that might be a more appropriate time period. And I, I, I'd be very pleased to share a little bit of the information that I stumbled across, mainly because I was reading a newspaper article on it. <laughs> and, and so I think that we were a little bit fast in going through that area um, as a council in our, in our last discussion of it. So I, I, I agree. Uh, we can get those changes made for Monday. And within the uh, RCD, uh, I'll actually identify that specific changes because it is new. Is it, would it be the consensus of council to change? So because we went with 11 p.m. because that was the quiet hours of the park. So would it be consensus of council here today to uh, have the alcohol consumption to a maximum of 9 p.m.? Yes, that would be my feeling. Councilor Lemko, go ahead. Uh, as, as discussed earlier, in, in that I, I'm not opposed to the cannabis or liquor, but uh, my view on this is that we have a playground there. We have a skate, like a little skateboard park. We encourage children and all that to be, and we're now designating a spot where you can consume cannabis and, uh, and alcohol, where the vast majority of our park users are not uh, those individuals. That So we're putting a law. We, we may be creating a... Um, an area for the public to <coughs> perception to change how we view uh, our parks and playgrounds. I just want to opinion. I, the majority of council can go either way. So, yes, Councilor Moore. Um, Moore. So yeah, I could be fine with the nine because I think our intention was never when we first talked about it. We said right now. Um, technically speaking, if somebody was to have a, a beverage, I think we talked more about the alcohol than the cannabis too. That was another part of it. We talked about the ability to have something in with a lunch or whatever versus um, the cannabis that creates the smell and some other options. So I think there is a little bit of a, us needing to know what we're exactly defining there. But um, I don't think our, we said we would potentially make it so that um, right now that wouldn't be allowed at all if they come in we said maybe we have a spot but I don't think we ever intended to have it where it would be just walking around openly anywhere within the parks area nor would the intention have been to have it be a place that people come to late at night to consume alcohol so I would certainly I think consensus would be that we'd consider at least the, the nine I think is very reasonable yeah. yeah I think that my opinion on it is nine o'clock primarily because the act actually says in a designated picnic area and so I think that coming down at 10 o'clock at night to a picnic is maybe a little bit late. And so, I mean, I, I think that with the municipalities that are running the pilot projects, such as Calgary, Edmonton, Vancouver, St. Albert, Strathcona, that are all using uh, designated picnic areas and 11 in the morning till 9, I think that our pilot project, because that's all this still is, is an opportunity to run a pilot project. I think that maybe we should be more consistent with those other communities. So there, uh, CAO Leggett. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair, and appreciate you bringing that to to our attention. We'll make those changes with uh, with respect to that section. I just want to confirm, though, before we uh, move on to the next item, that there's no other areas of the bylaw that uh, that might need change at, at this point. No, everything's good. Awesome. Okay, thank you. So our next item, we move on to Director LaFave. Thank you very much, Councillor Berry. This is correspondence from Biggerville Counting Services from William Powley. Uh, it is addressed to Town Council, Town of Biggerville. Uh, dear Council, it is regarding the back lane between 50 and 49th Street. It is with sadness and regret that I write this letter. I have had my business and approximately 20 others endure the sad shape of this back lane. In the past 40 plus years, this lane has never had a proper base prepared and a good paved job done. Uh, we have paid our taxes with the understanding that the town would see that this back lane would be looked after. It has had summer student workers patch it over and over again with shovels, but never a proper job. 
Is it possible to find it in your budget to have it sloped properly and paved? Just any of you have a minute, just one minute, please drive down this lane and see what I mean. Yours truly, William Powley. Thank you. Any discussions, comments? See you all like it. Yep. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so I did reach out to the writer of this letter uh, last week just to try and touch base and, and go over there and take a look, and uh, we weren't able to, to connect, but I've spoken to the director of uh, corporate services here, and I understand this lane or these sections of lane are in the, the budget, but in, uh, in a sort of distant future year, and I believe that was years 5 to 20? Six. Six, yeah. So, um, you know, sort of confirm back to the writer, they, they are in there, but I understand it's pretty darn pricey, it, it, you know, approaching a million dollars to do uh, to do these sections as well. So um, definitely not a, a light a decision to be taken lately here. Councilor Bullock. Is it, is it possible to something like just go in and patch again for now or fill potholes? That's what we do. Any other comments? So I'm, if you have responded back to them, I'm not certain that there's a need for it to come down to reg other than to be read into record. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll, uh, I'll take the step of reaching out to him again and uh, just letting him know those, those facts as we've kind of explained them here today. Thank you. <coughs> Now I believe that uh, CEO Leggett is going to read to us all 60 pages of the annual report. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> well, th I'd be happy to do that. It's an extremely well-written document, and uh, I'd like to extend my thanks to the uh, manager of communications and marketing for putting it together. So um, if I may, I'll start with the report. <clears throat> Uh, so this is uh, proposed by uh, Jameson Brown, our manager of communications and marketing. And the background is since 2019, the town of Vagerville has re uh, released an annual report in the hopes of capturing department highlights, functions and accomplishments of the preceding calendar year in an engaging manner. The annual report also includes an in-depth financial analysis that demonstrates the town's financial position and commitment to ongoing fiscal responsibility and transparency. In 2021, in the hopes of mitigating printing costs, the 2020 annual report was published online with the option for residents to request a printed copy by calling the Town of Agerville Administration Office. No printed copies were requested. Options, the Town of Agerville 2021 annual report, transitions, trials, and triumphs have been, has been reviewed by senior management and is ready for council <laughs> review. Options for council at this time uh, are, uh, number one, refer the annual report to the June, 20, uh, June 27th, 2022 council meeting for a council motion to publish, or number two, refer the annual report back to administration for any desired changes. So I'll ask if there's any comments or questions. Councillor Bullock. <clears throat> Well, I, I read through it and it uh, looks pretty good. Of course, I wasn't part of council last term, so in the last uh, area, but from what I see, it uh, looked very well written. And if anybody else has any further comments, because I can't give you comments on everything from that year. Councillor Lemko. Yeah, I've looked at uh, through it, uh, although briefly, uh, I like the layout. I like the uh, fact that we, uh, we uh, show departments and uh, the accomplishments of the departments and it's interesting when you budget for items to look in the the results that have been accomplished through the annual report and to see all the th actual work that's happening uh, in the community uh, is great to see as a report and I, re I encourage residents of the community to pick up a copy or uh, review it and uh, good job uh, uh, Jameson for uh, laying it out that way it's uh, it's well done any other comments? Well, I think what I'll add is I've gone through it. I think that it's a, a very good document. It's well presented. Um, a lot of detail to it. We've been privy to a lot of the information at different times being presented to it, but now that it's all combined and 
uh, available in a, in a publication. The public will be able to see some of the accomplishments and et cetera of the past year as well. So uh, I would ask council which option that you would actually prefer to do right now, Bring have it come down at our next regular meeting of June 27th uh, for a motion to publish? Or is there any reason for us to send it back to administration for changes? I can't say as I saw any reason for changes. So I think that we have a consensus here that we bring it down uh, for council to approve for publication. Option one it is. Thank yes. you. Yeah, I guess the next item actually is for myself. This um, next communication here uh, from Shannon Stubbs and two other MPs actually came to us at our last regular council meeting. We read it, we looked at it, and then we actually suggested that it come to this ledge meeting uh, as an action item. Um, where council would take a look at their request where they're saying they would like us to express the three most important issues impacting the economic development of a rural community. The letter is concerning economic contributions from rural communities that are so important to Canada's success and that in many ways, rural communities aren't given the same uh, appreciation or support as what our larger major communities are. And they would like to bring forward from communities all across Canada uh, some of the very important things uh, that we're concerned about. So I guess that what we can do here is have a quick discussion if, uh, if council present is able to think of a few items that are of very importance to rural community. Um, so do we have any, any thoughts on that? Uh, the other option we have <coughs> is, I know CAO Leggett has looked at some of this matter and had some communications. Uh, we could ask administration to compile a few things that administration uh, looks at as being economic needs for our community and area. We could distribute that amongst all council uh, so that uh, the three councillors who are not able to be present with us right now have an opportunity to be involved in this discussion. <clears throat> and then we could formalize um, what three issues or items we would like to have administration send uh, in response to this letter. So see how like it is, how would you view that? Thank you, Mr. Chair, I'd be happy to do that for you. And uh, yeah, I could get back with four or five different options there. Yeah. I think that it might be easier for us to actually take a look at everything uh, outside of a meeting and, and be able to give some better concentration to it. Yeah, sure. Thank you. <clears throat> the next one here is to acknowledge a letter from White Court. Who are asking for an endorsement for an FCM, a Federation of Community Municipal Canadian Municipalities. Oh, I wrecked that one up. Um, a resolution that they're submitting in terms of the importance of Canadian oil and gas resources. Rather than reading the entire resolution, which is in the package and available to the public as well, um, I will paraphrase it 
because the two documents are very similar. What they're expressing and asking the Federation of Canadian Municipalities to lobby the Government of Canada to promote and encourage the consumption of Canadian oil and gas products over the use of energy products imported from other countries and implement policy that requires an imported oil and gas consumption in Canada to, to meet the same laws that Canadian producers must adhere to, including governance, environmental and human rights standards. They are pre presenting or making this submission and I think what they're actually looking for is support across through other municipalities um, to support their uh, submission of this or endorse this uh, resolution. Um, there's a lot of whereases that I don't want to try and go through, but I think that we do recognize what their point is, is that our own resources are being underutilized while other resources are being imported into Canada. So I'll leave that at the moment here and just ask if anybody has any comments that they'd like to make. Councillor Bullock. Yeah, well, I think the oil and gas industry is very important to our area. Of, uh, just uh, some of the local businesses over the years that have benefited from the work that the oil and gas industry has supported this town. So I think it's a very good thing to consider to do, and I think the oil and gas industry has a future. Uh, we may be mostly agriculture, but we still are surrounded by oil and gas, and I'd definitely like to see sport going forward for that industry. It's important to us. So I will, three, I will read the three areas that they're saying be resolved. Resolved that the Federation of Canadian Municipalities call on the Government of Canada to promote and encourage the consumption of Canadian oil and gas products over the use of energy products imported from other countries and be it further resolved that the Canadian Federation, that the Federation of Canadian Municipalities call on the Government of Canada to support a policy that all oil and gas imported and consumed in Canada meet the same stringent environmental governance and social standards that Canadian oil and gas producers must adhere to and be it further resolved the Federation of Canadian Municipalities recognize and promote the economic opportunities that the consumption of Canadian energy products will have on the Canadian economy and the resulting benefits Canadian municipalities will acquire through increases in collecting royalties and taxes. So that is what basically they're looking for an endorsement and support on. Um, Councillor Warwell. I think one of the hard balances that we always try and find is whenever we're asked to support any letters that come in is not picking sides of things that are potentially issues at times. Um, I do have no issue with us supporting this on my own stance, but I think the one thing I just want to recognize is this support for what they're asking for, and I, I read it pretty in depth, this is kind of the background of a lot of what I do. Um, their specific is not about whether you support the use of oil and gas. I just don't want us or anyone to think that that's what this is about. This is specifically to the endorsement of support over Canadian oil and gas and the fact that we are, and it has been proven, even those that want for a reduction of usage of uh, oil and gas have had to acknowledge the fact that globally we are a leader, um, but we also right now are at times um, stifling our own consumption or our own development at the same time as we have Canada importing oil and gas from Saudi Arabia, from Venezuela, and that's a reality. I mean, that's a fact of what's happening. So in this particular case, while I am sometimes concerned about picking an issue, I don't believe that this issue is uh, for or against energy consumption or for or against environmental protection in any way. In fact, I think what it is saying is let's acknowledge what we do have in Canada and let's promote it. So on that stance, I am comfortable with us considering supporting, but I just wanted to, to bring that out because I know sometimes it's easy to get sucked into the do we believe we should be using uh, or reducing our energy usage. This isn't about our amount that we're using. It's about talking about the standards um, and acknowledging what we have in Canada. So, 
Any further discussion? Then I think what we would probably support is having this brought down to our regular council meeting when we have full council and we'll read it into record, discuss it at a little more in depth and decide on a direction for administration as to whether we draft an endorsement or not. So that's where we can leave that one. Thank you. <clears throat> the last item for myself is uh, a reoccurring and continuing um, series of letters that we continue to keep getting from other communities. So we have actually discussed it and made our responses more than once. And that is, this one here is from the County of St. Paul. Um, once again, issuing a letter to the Alberta Utilities Commission regarding the rising cost of Alberta utility fees and looking at asking the Alberta Utilities Commission to look into the situation and see if there isn't some way that prices can be more regulated and brought down. So I, I think that this goes along with the three or four that we had at the last meeting and the meeting before and the meeting before. And um, we recognize that many municipalities have a concern about the rising cost of Alberta utility fees. And they're, from there, these are letters that are not really sent directly to council, but they're blanket to everybody across the province, every municipality when they do write one. So we'll thank them for including us in their correspondence. So we come to our round table discussions, which should be fairly short and sweet. I will just start at the far, 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 far side to Councillor Lemko. Thank you, uh, Councillor Baird. Uh, my report is uh, more of an acknowledgement of uh, the activities that are happening in the community. But first of all, um, today's uh, the uh, last full day of employment for uh, a long-serving member of our community. Um, uh, Donna Williams, our librarian, is uh, moving on with another adventure in her life after, I believe, 26 years of employment with uh, as a town. And she's also been a... Um, a great volunteer outside of employment, taking on many projects and, and that stuff. So good luck in your uh, in her future endeavors and uh, she'll be uh, missed by uh, many volunteer groups and the community as a whole. I want to also talk about uh, this past weekend. Uh, kudos to the uh, organizers of, uh, of all the events that took place. The, uh, the garage sale event, I believe uh, from all indications that are meeting last night there was uh, over 70 uh, garage sale sites including tables at the arena and such the um, uh, lemonade day uh, we had uh, four uh, lemonade stands in town with the entrepreneurs uh, uh, pelling their wares um, I was uh, able to attend uh, a couple of them and um, got some magical lemonade uh, and uh, I did inquire with the young lady there if she had a building permit and she was, uh, um, I mean a business license, sorry, and she uh, quickly showed me where it was and thanked me for asking and uh, it, it was good. It, I liked the, the process. The demo derby on Sunday, uh, record crowds. There was in the parking spot, even in my end of town. Uh, it was uh, huge. All the um, businesses, uh, the restaurants, they were all full. Uh, it was uh, uh, one of probably the biggest attended one that I've seen in a long time. 50-50 was uh, over $11,000 raised, I believe. Uh, and I'm not sure who the winner was, but it wasn't me. Uh, and then uh, the Young Farts had their um, uh, trailer giveaway. Um, and uh, another great event put on by uh, two local uh, fellows at the RV place. Uh, I believe the winner, uh, you put your hand on the trailer and the, uh, the one who could stand there the longest uh, with their hand on the trailer, wins a RV. It was close to 48 hours before someone was uh, 
but the beauty of the, the thing is that they were they were live on on uh, their social media live on TikTok and the amount of people that that generated are well aware now of our community and uh, and the things that are happening here kudos to all the other work that's going on Foxview uh, we got uh, three houses coming up there right now uh, they're in the construction stages at various levels good to see lots of energy out that way prosperity park and uh, all the amount of earth that's been moved uh, uh, and I, I, I the foreman must be a magician out there in all that water and stuff to decide who moves dirt which way and what way because it's all coming up so exciting to drive by there and, and seeing the rain benefited uh, our corn maze and all the other things that are going on so it's a busy town thank you councilor warlock uh, i just have two items again and um they're not technically meetings but one the second one actually just kind of want to bring forward for timing but the first one i had um mentioned to council uh, just a little while back about the potential that as a town of Vegreville we could change what our boundary is for our um, federal boundaries. Uh, it's proposed that Vegreville would be one of the communities to no longer be in the Lakeland boundaries. And the only reason I'm bringing that up, it doesn't need to be massively discussed today, but I did get a call um, from the mayor from Lloyd Minister, who had some concerns a little bit like I had mentioned before, that, that he wasn't sure that it made sense. And again, right now it's just proposed, but um, if you would look at Lakeland, what would end up happening would be it would kind of go down Highway 16 and it would take now Fort Saskatchewan within it, but it would jut out and Vegreville would not be part of it, but then everything else on Highway 16 would all be part of the Lakeland boundary except us, and it would follow right around Highway 16 and then jut out and take Lloyd Minister out. And Lloyd Minister and Vegreville would just basically be plucked from this side of Highway 16 and thrown into Battle River Crowfoot, uh, which would be MP Kirk's um, riding. Uh, and the only reason I just want to highlight that is because with the proposed boundary changes, they give opportunity for public consultation. Uh, there is one scheduled in Vegreville. It will be September 14th. However, in order to make a presentation, if we want to or if individuals want to, you do have to submit um, in August. I believe it's the 15th, but I'll get you the exact information on it. I have it in my office. Um, you putting in your name, who and what you're representing um, in order to be able to have an ability to uh, present. I think that it's just something that I'd like to highlight to you um, to put on our, our radar somewhere for a, a conversation at some point. Um, again, this is nothing to do with, uh, I think everybody knows, obviously I work for the Lakeland MP. It doesn't impact me in any way whatsoever, but the part that becomes glaring as the person who does the communities is there's so many funding programs that are federal provincial components and almost all of the partners that we currently work with would then be in a different federal riding which would always mean crossing over between the federal ridings I mean we we know we deal how much with Lamont County we have students from I understand some things are provincial but we have to think overall our sports teams have from often from Two Hills from Indair from Lamont from Andrew our FCSS helps those areas, our parent lake helps those areas, our hospital helps those areas, and it will be somewhat of a strange breakup because we would then be more into, first of all, counties we don't border, and then the only other county that we'd border back would be Beaver, which currently when the provincial boundaries were redone, Toefield used to be included in the Fort Saskatchewan Vegreville provincial boundary, and they removed it for the very reason that they said it made no sense with the fundings and model. So I would just want to highlight it and, um, you know, residents have an opportunity, groups and organizations have an opportunity to speak, but I think we may want to discuss whether, as a council, we would like to make some presentation on it. And again, not trying to influence, but in my conversation with the mayor today, his concerns were exactly the same. And um, I would, I guess I'm cautious to say this, but in my personal belief in the role that I do, when it comes to federal funding and applications, if we were talking about swapping out being with, say, Fort Saskatchewan to Lloyd Minister, Vegreville is more aligned with the communities within Lakeland in the in that we're closer, say, to Lloyd's premise. So that's why Lloyd really was not interested in losing Vegreville, for example. They they still were very interested in saying, hey, they belong with us. Lloyd Minister particularly is going to argue on the fact of Vermilion. I mean, they share campus colleges. They they share a lot of uh, items. So I just wanted to highlight that to everyone. 
And then the one other thing I wanted to bring forward was at the last meeting, uh, the mayor had asked me to reach out to Lana Santana, who's from Fort Saskatchewan. And uh, I was fortunate that I actually have had a past relationship with Lana. So we had a quick phone call. And then earlier today, we actually did a Zoom meeting. <coughs> So she kind of just asked me to bring back to the council and senior management. Um, obviously what she's done is through various, there's various forms of funding which she helps set up for grants, but she deals very much with welcoming and inclusive, which is something we always talk about, but she deals with us getting to that step that I think is what we really want to achieve, which is getting past us doing welcoming and inclusive initiatives. And at one point it just being the way we are, right? And that's very much what she's about. So she has started off in certain communities, helping plan an odd event or coming into the schools. She does a lot of those things and she will look to apply for funding and do some of that within Vegreville. Um, however, and, and she did want to highlight that we may want to start with some little thing uh, in September when is the next set of Alberta Cultural Days. But she, I said to her, what would you want as the first step? So as a first step, she obviously would like to be put in touch with Julie, would like to meet Julie through FCSS because she said obviously FCSS is a good driver. But she brought up something first which she actually said to her was the very first step. She'd like to come out to Vegreville because she hasn't been here. So certainly told her if she'd like to come out and we'll show her around and, and everything, that was great. But she said she would actually like to meet with um, council and senior admin because she said um, every place she's ever worked with asked the same question, which I think we've all sat around and asked it, what does it mean to be inclusive? What is that? And she said that that's really her specialty of what she can do is sitting down and talking to everybody about what it means to be inclusive. And she was, she had two different terms she used. Uh, the other one I've written down and she said she'd explain more, but the one that I kind of laughed at a little bit, she was calling it unconscious dismissal. So she was saying that that is where we, in our everyday lives, nothing to do with counsel or anything else, how often we dismiss something unconsciously. Don't even think about like taking it out of the realm of what we'd be interested in or how we made our decision. And she used a really simple um, statement when she did that. She said, you go to a store and you go to pick up fruit and it's been indoctrined into your brain that you're looking at a certain kind of skin and it should look a certain way and it shouldn't be bruised. But if I cut that up and served it to you, it might be better fruit than the one you picked out. And she said, because we've grown up and we've, we're not doing it intentionally in any way. We're not intentionally making choices that are you know, not including people or are limiting, but it's just we've grown up in a certain way and we just automatically default to some of these decisions. So she said that's one of the conversations she would like. So um, she asked me just to come here and see if, you know, if we could get some consensus if council was interested in meeting with her, having her come to the community. This isn't something that um, costs us or anything. So if, if I knew that the group was interested, I'll start to work with her on that and bring a date. So. I'm kind of looking that everybody seems mm -hmm. like they would be okay. Yeah, yeah. So I think it would be a great first start. And then her thought was that she would attempt to be able to get in and do some things within the school, um, potentially within the fall, and maybe something during September um, in a different way. And she said that right now she's done a lot of different um, types. She's worked within Elk Island Public Schools, so she's already known within there. Um, and she caters things to different starting points. As simple as in the schools, in one of the schools she was in last year, they worked on everybody within a few classes identifying their background and heritage and then they had a foods day and they had a, a flag day and talked about the different things but she also um, has access to people like African drummers and um, she said uh, during some a um, some awareness for Asian culture she has um, a ability to bring in people that could help doing crafts and maybe that's even something that could be a weekend at a corn maze or something like that but the first step that she thought of was just if she could talk to us about what she does and just talk to us about what her eventual you know plan is and stuff so that's all I got thank you Councillor Bellick <clears throat> okay so uh, last week had the, the pleasure of uh, joining Alberta municipalities at their summer caucus a couple of highlighted things were uh, there was electric vehicle charging program that was talked about is up to 100% rebate up to 200,000 for municipality so that's could be a good idea thing for us to look into it might be 100% covered uh, and then also for businesses even up to a 46% uh, rebate up to 100,000 for businesses so that's uh, probably one of the things that are pretty interesting that's coming on the horizon and it's available to us so um, also uh, we talked about climate resiliency capacity building program 
so that's assessing climate risks and stuff like that so uh, looking at doing green things so there's a lot of neat things on the horizon for that also looked at the new funding program instead of uh, MSI got back into the depth about the LLGF so that we talked about as well uh, lemonade day I was uh, one of the judges actually going around uh, checking out all the lemonade stands and all the kids and seeing how good it was uh, going for them they were pretty busy at uh, a lot of the spots there so they were it's quite interesting to see how they were uh, doing with all that uh, as well the, the uh, Father's Day event on the weekend I gotta give a, a, a round of applause to uh, the Vagerville Iron Runners the uh, Vagerville Agricultural Society uh, without those volunteers it would have been pretty hard to pull off an event like that uh, and I, I know for a fact there was over 4,000 people that attended that event so the town pretty much doubled its size or close you know in that area the financial impact I can't say any more of how it financially impacts this town with that event and how important it is to volunteer in this community so anybody looking to volunteer out there there's great organizations like the iron runners and the very well Agri society they could use your help uh, Councillor Lemko's right the uh, 50 50 was 11,000 over 11,000 so that was another great thing for somebody that wanted out there wasn't myself either um, <laughs> so it, it was interesting talking to some of the people that came to the area and they were commenting you know how great an event this was and they missed the event ones that have returned to our area and as I was leaving that uh, Father's Day event and drove all the way down picking up the signs you know showing where the car show and the event was and just seeing every restaurant, every parking lot full, the gas stations had vehicles at them all. So the economic impact is true, and it happens with these events. We don't want to lose them. So we want to do the best we can to support these events and what they do for our town. Um, as well, the Young Farts RV Farts have their hand on the trailer event. Uh, Councilor Lemko's right, I stopped by there, had a look. I just happened to be there when it finished. and. Uh, they could barely stand the the last two but they were right there it was almost 48 hours later so uh yeah it was quite interesting and needless to say they gave them a trailer to sleep in for a while after <laughs> that, so, <laughs> so that, that was uh really good as well and just you know hearing the buzz about what's going on around town a lot, a lot of people talking about what's happening at uh, prosperity park you know they're just questioning what's going on and Lots of rain water, so everyone's pretty happy. We've got rain for our grass, and now, now we got tall grass, and now we're going to be cutting it. So that's a good thing, too, right? So awesome. That's all I got for now. Thank you. Um, I don't have a whole lot, but I would like to say that I, I think that your reports that you brought forward does demonstrate just how important the various businesses, the organizations uh, are to the community in terms of the, if you think of just this weekend alone, the number of visitors that were brought into the community. Uh, I think that it's, and I definitely echo, if it wasn't for volunteers, I, and we need to really keep trying to encourage people to step up and volunteer because it makes the community that much better. The only thing I have is, is some kudos that we sort of received from the town. Uh, we put on the Bigger, the uh, Vermilion River Watershed Alliance annual general meeting and uh, a strategy planning session for the entire day on the 16th out at the event center. And we had counselors from throughout the entire watershed. We had some government people there. Uh, and I think what we really heard the most of is the facility is a great place to have a meeting like that. It was extremely comfortable, it's bright, it's friendly. Uh, the table arrangements that we had worked out perfect because we could take the five round tables and put each of our big sheets on them and break up into sessions and then move around. Uh, it, was, uh, it really worked out great. It was nice and bright. The windows were bright. It was nice. We could open up all the windows. And what everybody appreciated was we weren't really in a noisy area because we sat there with the breeze coming through and listening to the birds in the trees. And at lunchtime, some of them went out and walked through the, the grounds or sat at a picnic table for their lunch outside. Uh, I think that if we keep advertising and promoting 
we're going to find that it's a very comfortable place for meetings of this nature, uh, much more so than a lot of our other meeting areas because we're away from things. It's almost like taking a little retreat. <laughs> and uh, I'm certain that w we almost had Wi-Fi operating there, but I'm certain with the tower being up and it going, I'm waiting for them to tell us the day after our meeting, yes, it's up and running. We did manage to Zoom, um, but it wasn't as great. But we did communicate with somebody in Ontario. So, you know, I mean, overall, I think that as it develops, um, we need to encourage that it's a good facility, that it's coming along nicely. So that's all I had to, to sort of say that uh, I was impressed by how people from other communities around here were taking to that. And yes, they were also looking at all the earth being moved to the north and very excited about it. So um, I, I think, yes, the only other, only other thing is that a couple of councillor and myself, I guess mainly all of council, uh, Lobster Fest, I was really impressed with how well that was organized. And again, <clears throat> a lot of volunteers, uh, a lot of youth volunteers, which I thought was really great too. But it, that was a, a very enjoyable night, even though we stood behind the bar and served others. Uh, <laughs> it was nice to keep seeing their smiling faces. And, and it was actually quite enjoyable. But I think that the turnout that they had was phenomenal. And um, I, I think that's a great, ev great event. So. There's a lot going on in town, and I think we can be proud of it. So I guess we'll move on then to our director's highlights and see if they can outdo us. <laughs> we'll start with Director Rowe. <laughs> no pressure. No pressure. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so um, as I instructed the council yesterday and letting the community know, uh, we had an emergency shutdown at the pool yesterday due to a pump malfunction. Good news is the splash park is, is up and running, so we got the parts in place, so trade one for the other. Uh, I know it's been, uh, some of councillor members have been uh, talked about uh, in the community about some of the uh, long grass, and uh, we are, the parks department is working hard to get through it. We're down three of our large mowers right now. So the park staff is uh, working diligently to try and get uh, caught up, and uh, <clears throat> there uh, this weekend coming up, the Lakeland Cup is being hosted in Vagerville. So there's approximately 800 uh, potential soccer stars uh, in our community, along with their families. So we're, uh, Parks has been working closely with Vagerville Minor Soccer to get bleachers and picnic tables for their event this weekend. Uh, we've also been approached by a, uh, a large ball group out of uh, the greater Edmonton area and they're looking at uh, potentially coming here July 9th with 40 plus slow pitch teams. Mm -hmm. So we're uh, getting some, compiling some information from them uh, and this actually comes right back to what we were talking in the parks and open spaces bylaw about <laughs> having potential beer gardens and camping at the uh, at the ball gra at the at the ball diamonds so uh, uh, Danny and I will be uh, uh, gathering that information and bringing some decision making for council so uh, again good news they say they uh, they were impressed with our diamonds I guess uh, a couple of members of these ball teams happened to be here they liked our diamonds and they liked the community and it's close to Edmonton and they wanted to be out of the city and our rates were good, so they're seriously considering bringing a very large tournament and making it an annual thing, possibly too. So, did I did I outdo you? Oh, uh, close. <laughs> 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 a good add-on, at least. Okay, so now we'll have to move over to uh, Director Lefebvre. Thank you, Councillor Barry. Um, the Household Hazardous Waste was also this Saturday, another event that the yes. town had put on. I talked with Phyllis, uh, the lead hand at the VMurf, and she said it wasn't as busy as last year, but it was still a busy, busy day for them. So it was nice to hear we're still participating in the Roundup and not doing bad things with chemicals you shouldn't do bad things with. So 
Um, the underground deep services for Prosperity Park are being installed now. That's the water and sewer mains. They're on at the lift station, the new lift station side, and they're also across 144 and are heading west. So the main line for the park is being installed right now. Uh, earthworks continues at a good pace, except for some rain. Slowed them down for a bit, obviously, but <coughs> see we're back, back moving tracks around. The vault for the new forest main sewer line for the new lift station has arrived and uh, we'll be, we're dewatering the primary cells. Remember when our tour, we saw the primaries? We're gonna pump those down and then they're gonna install uh, a, a vault, chamber vault for the new lift station, which is not in the same location as the one you saw in your tour. That's the original one, that's the one that will remain. So things are happening out there as well. Um, and we have been in contact with at Electric, they've been in contact with us actually about the EV program, and we're trying to set up a, a day where Fleet and myself and them can get together. So we'll get the get the solid information for you from there. That's my report. Excellent. Glad to see that Lagoon is uh, still important to us. Yes, they are. <laughs> <laughs> Director Sesk. Thank you. I also have two good news stories. The Atco Streetlights LED conversion is project was underway starting yesterday. So you will see the Atco crews in town. They have a couple trucks and a couple bucket trucks. So to be continued. And we also received word that the CRF agreement for the Rotary Bike and Skate Park has been approved for 267, almost 268,000. The project is now fully funded and there's an upcoming meeting this week to discuss timelines and construction. So wonderful news to hear from the Rotary. And that's all I've got. Wow. Nothing but good news. Good news. So now we're down to CAO's <laughs> highlights <laughs> on the action item report. <laughs> Thank it's you, Mr. Jared. This I've, is a tough one to follow. Well, and I've pretty much got no news. So I might have the honor <laughs> of being the shortest here tonight. So uh, nothing to update you on past what's, uh, what's on the sheet at, at this time. <clears throat> so guess run down through um, our upcoming events. We have corporate organizing presentation on June 24th, which I'm looking forward to. Council meeting June 27th, that's our regular council. Canada Day, office will be closed on July the 1st. Then we have Pasanka Festival on the 1st to 3rd. That should bring another bunch of people into the community, so it'll be another weekend of full activities. Ledge meeting on July the 5th, council meeting on the 25th, and um, the civic holiday closure, August the 1st. So be, the building will be closed again then. And then we'll be moving into the Deerland County Fair, which will be five days again this year, uh, from the 3rd to the 7th. So again, many, many people will be coming into the community for that. So I, it's gonna be a very good one. Uh, ledge committee on August 16th, Council meeting on the 22nd, and the Labor Day office will be closed on the 5th. And the final parting shot is Councillor Lemko is going to go on a fishing trip. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll be staying home. So I guess that's the highlights for the moment. <laughs> Unless there's anything else that we have. Uh, go ahead, Councillor. Sandra, I probably did this myself. Can you just clarify, on Friday morning, it's just a Zoom meeting because I've entered it twice and one shows in person. So was it either one for Friday or it's just Zoom, right? It's in person. Okay, well then I'm going to take that one out. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so um, if there's no other further business here, I would like to take a motion to go into closed session. Councillor Bullock. And that's at, by mine is 420. 